their lives. We, we do. We do need somebody to take note. Hello, and welcome back to Noob Builds Van with much electricity. Much excite. Today, this morning, we're talking about uh, the wiring. The beginnings of the wiring, anyway, not really going into much of the detail other than where I ran it because this is basically going to end up in talking about the ceiling panels of insulation. So to figure out the wiring, I basically had to figure out every single route that was going to go through the van to figure out which ones of them were going through the ceiling because that's what mattered right now. It was doing the ceiling wiring. So I did that. I made a spreadsheet, put all the things in place, figured out the wires I needed for each one took that, figured out the conduit I needed for everything, and it took a while. It was pretty complicated. I think most people could probably get away with a much simpler approach. Most people probably don't need three different kinds of wire and yeah, just probably don't want lots of different places where they're putting USB ports and 12 volt sockets. My setup is complicated from the wiring, but that's, it was always going to be, it was always going to be electric heavy. So, you know, it is what it is. So yeah, I overestimated the wiring. I gave myself like an extra 30% over what I thought I would need because I knew that extra was a good idea. But I then sort of failed to actually cut according to those estimates, those extra bits that I'd gotten when I did the conduit because it's it's quite hard to figure out with all these coiled up cables that are just curling all over the place and just generally being horrible, as is the conduit. It's very difficult to figure out how much you need and you can't really get it through the conduit reliably without bundling all the cables together. So you pretty much have to know up front. You can't really measure it. So there's a lot of guesswork involved and I guessed pretty poorly, at least at the beginning. I definitely got better at it, at least made all the cables consistent lengths, which I do recommend because once you've like electrical taped them all together and got them through the conduit somehow, you that you can't really move them. So having different different lengths of cable doesn't really have any advantage unless you stick it out at one end or the other. But even then, it's still not that great of an idea. You might as well just figure out what the longest cable needs to be and make it that long you don't really get much benefit from doing anything else. So that that's what I did later on. Not so much for the roof ones. I kind of messed those up. I also overestimated the size of conduit that I needed, but again, that's kind of a good thing as far as I can tell, because if you've got really tight cable size to conduit, you're gonna have a really hard time pulling it through the conduit. I have so much more respect for electricians after having realized that that's presumably a decent chunk of what they do is figuring out good techniques for pull, pulling cable through conduit. It's it's nasty. Like it was it was horrible, especially when it's in place on the walls. It's just just really difficult. You need something pulling as well as pushing. You need to push and pull for the most part. It's easier to get it through if you do not put it on the wall first. However, I sort of haphazardly stuck things where I want them to be just to get an idea of where it was. So I was trying to push and pull through at least one that was on the wall. And it was it was tough. We ended up using the trick of pulling a bit of string through with a vacuum cleaner and then tying it to the other end and then pulling or tying, sort of electrical taping it to the other end. You can't really tie it, it'll just fly off. That that worked and then push and pull. I did do that, but only really for that for the one long route, route B as I've called it, that's going over the ceiling and down to the door. I'll explain in detail in a later video, I think what, what I did in terms of planning this out because it deserves its own focused thing. But yeah, generally when it comes to cutting the wiring, overestimate, cut a really nice long wire, have extra. You might, if you're like me, feel sad when you're cutting it down and cutting off these extra bits, but it's better than the worst case scenario of you like losing the end of a cable or it being so close to the edge that you can't crimp it. I had a couple that were like that. I still do because I, I, I crimped a few of them just on this route where it was the sketchiest because it was one of the first ones I did. I just wanted to make sure that I could get the cables in the ceiling 
So I have crimped them now. And I managed to do it. It was awkward. And there's others that are really close to the holes. And I'm a little bit nervous about it. It's fine though. I think I think it'll all be fine. It just I've just cut it a bit close to the wire. And I just recommend like, you know, give yourself an extra 50 centimeters on every cable. Um, uh, well, especially all the small ones where it's cheap and, you know, basically a, tr a trivial amount of money to give yourself that extra length because y you'll thank yourself for it. And so once I'd got all the conduit in place, I kind of, I figured that I didn't really want to decide where I was running it until I kind of figured how the control panel was going to work. Because there's a, there's a big sticky out strut thing that is a bit awkward to get around and I've not I've not framed past it with wood at this point in the equation so it wasn't really clear what was going to go, happen there I figured that's a good place for a control panel because it's kind of it's going to have to stick out anyway so I might as well make it stick out even more and put a feature into it sort of make it look deliberate I guess but it wasn't exactly clear how that was going to work so that kind of needed to be figured out and we sort of did the left hand side first in terms of bringing a piece of wood out that was that can be sort of the back plate uh potentially or just a, a springing point off to, to to bring a little bit more batten out so that we can sort of put just a, a front on it that i can then cut into for my various different switches and and buttons and widgets and whatnots so that went okay um i I, use, I, I like split some of this 3x2 that I got way too much of in my initial buy of wood. Uh, it took ages to cut it because I'm cutting it like lengthways and that's obviously not a great thing to do with a jigsaw. Um, I, I like fully ear plugged up and just sort of got into it and I don't know, it must have taken like half an hour or something. <laughs> I didn't do the full length because they're, they're massive. They're like 2 meter 40 huge things of, of 3 by 2 um, I don't know what I'm going to use the rest of mine for. I've figured out some uses, but I think I'm still going to have stuff left later. I swear you could build a house out of that stuff easily. Yeah, and then the right hand side, I used some thinner batten and sort of padded it out at the bottom with a few squares of things and like bit. Uh, the, I used just like bits, off cuts of plywood and off cuts of bit of wood, screws and more of the pseudo fixel turbo as well, just to make everything really solid and it, se it seems good you know it's not really going to have anything too heavy hanging off it so once that was sorted i kind of had a better idea of where all my conduit was going which was the whole idea really even though i wasn't putting it all in place i wanted to know where it was all going to go roughly before kind of locking locking things into place or fixing things more permanently i think i think it makes sense it's maybe a bit extra paranoid but that's kind of the theme of my whole build slash life Oh yeah, I didn't go all the way to the floor with the right hand frame for the for the control panel because there's conduit in the way and I didn't really have a piece of wood that was appropriate to do it. It just didn't really make that much sense. I don't think it's really going to matter. I have on the left hand side, so maybe that'll come in useful for the cupboards or something at some point. I don't really know what's going to happen down there though and it's all going to be in a cupboard and kind of out of sight. So I'm not really worried about it looking neat and together. I'm just worried about it working functionally. We'll, we'll figure that out later. So yeah, everything was fixed in. Well, I had a good idea of where things were going in terms of conduit going through the ceiling. So I could kind of start carving out channels. One thing, one noteworthy thing about that is my, my original build or my original sort of specking of all this out and buying, I bought this sort of really thin PVC tube that I thought would be appropriate for just the wiring for the lights that were just going in the circuits in the middle because it's just lighting, it's really thin cable. But it's just impossible to actually get the cable through the little the little tubes. Like they're, they're, so, they're so tiny. And I, I thought I bought big enough that it would be fine, but apparently not. I will also compile a list of all the things that I bought that I haven't used at the end of this because that's going to be a painful list. But I might, you know, might as well, might as well share the pain, share the love, share the pain, share the e e everything. Well, maybe not everything, but you know, the pertinent details. Yeah. So then I cut the 
the channels in the insulation. And this was a horrible job. There wasn't really a very good way to do it. I think the technique that I figured out was kind of the first thing that sprung into my head. I, I think it's as good as anything else. I basically drew out, marked out where the channels needed to be and then tried to score that line getting, you know, through the kind of cardboardy foil top layer with a Stanley. And then just sort of peeled and spooned out the rest with a spoon from my kitchen. And you can use both ends depending on how much space you have and how big the channel needs to be. But you just you just kind of scrape it out and it's just horrible because polystyrene goes everywhere. But I don't think there's a nicer way of doing it to like cut out a, a square all, all the way down or a rectangle basically. Maybe it would be better to just not put insulation in those points and just like spray foam them into place and spray foam around them. But then the rest of the place where you're using insulation board, you wouldn't be able to friction that in. So you'd have to spray foam it at the time you cut it, which is fine, I guess. And maybe that is a better way of doing it. But I did it this way and it, it, I got there. I do actually have video evidence of me cutting it out with a spoon. It probably looks as ridiculous as it felt at the time. And it, it is pretty ridiculous. One regret from that was not giving myself just a bit more space and a bit more channel. Because there was a few places where I just left the channels out, sort of forgetting that while there wasn't pipe there, the cables were still going to have to go through there and they still kind of needed some space because the cladding was going to be very close to the insulation. So yeah, be, be reasonably generous with your channels. You can always fill in the gaps with spray foam if you feel like you overdid it. Although obviously don't go all the way through the insulation or you've kind of just ended up with plan B uh, involuntarily. I then decided to fix in place more permanently a lot of the conduit or at least, at least the sort of the roots towards the front, which are roots A and B. Um, I kind of, as, as it went on, I sort of fixed things less and less permanently because I think I'm once I've got all of the conduit together, I want to sort of tie it together and tie it as one thing in a few places. Maybe I won't, maybe it'll be too massive because there's quite a lot of it, but you know, we'll try it. What could go wrong? But anyway, I, I got the first few routes quite nicely held in place. I bought some cable ties, which weren't going to be useful in that many different spots because you need two holes that are close together, that are in the right place for the cable tie to go through. But there were still a few places where I used them and I got some some advertising itself as extra strong duct tape, uh, T-Rex brand. And it does seem pretty good. It it's It hasn't moved so far for all the stuff that I've stuck in place. And this was like probably a week ago at the time I'm talking about this, maybe, maybe slightly less. I've kind of lost all track of time because I've just been in van land for 12 hours a day even when i'm trying not to be it just happens anyway but um yeah it's all good fun oh yeah so i made sure to label using just writing with a pen on some masking tape on the battery or power station as i've been calling it end of the conduit just label which one they are according to my labeling plan my root names because you're gonna get lost and it's gonna be a pain trying to figure it out I do not have all of the individual wires labeled. Mostly it will be possible to just figure that out because there aren't multiple wires of the same size in the same conduit, just out of kind of partially luck and partially planning of not needing more than one thing of the same kind in the same place. But there are a couple of spots where I'm gonna to have to just use trial and error to figure out what they are. And then I will label them at the fuse box slash negative bus bar end because let's face it, like you, you want that information. If something goes wrong, or even just when you're wiring things up, you you kind of you kind of want to know, just so you can do a logical job of it. Which ones? Which? Who knows? So then it came time to bring out the dreaded spray foam. I really avoided spray foam. I really did not want to use spray foam for the longest time because I heard so much about how it made a mess and it was very permanent, like hard to remove and you kind of mess things up with it. And it just, it just all sounded rather scary, but I sort of finally conceded to the idea that, hey, everyone sticks their, their insulation board in with spray foam. It probably just is the way to do it. All other alternatives, don't seem as good 
Like they seem way less effective and it's probably not that bad. And yeah, it's really not that bad. In fact, for all the warnings I've had about it, it's probably not even in top 10 hardest things. I found it reasonably easy to use the gun. It's a little bit, I think I overshook the bottle a little bit. So at first it was a little bit haphazard, but it was still fine. And, you know, as long as you account for the fact that it's going to approximately double in size, I don't really see how you would overfill without just kind of, I don't know, being just ridiculously overzealous. Basically, unless you just don't understand what the concept of expanding means, I don't really know how you'd mess this up. But at the same time, I am naturally a very careful, cautious kind of person. So I'm probably not the person who really needs the huge warnings to be careful with spray foam in particular, because I'm just nervous of it anyway. I thought it was going to make a big mess. As it turns out, like even if you do make a bit of a mess with it, once it's kind of expanded and dried, you can usually just sort of pick it off and that's fine. I'm sure there are some things that we shouldn't touch, but I had some cardboard boxes to lay down and some some like under carpet, f under flooring stuff that my mum had left over from the last time she had carpets fitted. So with that in place, all was good. I, only a few little blobs fell down and it largely was pretty uneventful. I don't really have any footage of it because I was a bit nervous and just trying to use the spray foam and get on with it. And, you know, I was worried the gun was going to sort of jam up or whatever. And I, I kind of needn't have been worried about that because it's been fine. What I didn't realize is that if you've got a half used can, you just leave the can on the gun and close it up. And it's kind of just okay. Somehow it doesn't end up really clogging. And if it does, you just sort of you just need to sort of poke a hole through with a pin and you can, you can get right back to business. So once you kind of got the gun loaded up with a, with a, with a counter, you've got access to spray foam whenever you want to just do little bits and bobs here and there, which has come in really handy. Um, as one side, stuck all the insulation in place and give it a bit of time to make sure it had bedded in and, and stuck. And it did stick pretty well. Even the corner bit that wasn't friction sticking managed to get that to stick okay. Yeah, then I got the conduit into the, the channels that I'd cut out, stuck that in place with the, the duct tape, then covered that with foil tape. And I also sort of spray foamed around it a little bit, uh, more towards the end, because I kind of forgot at the beginning that I could do that. Just where I sort of extra carved out the channels, because, you know, it's, it's a very haphazard process. So you end up with some bits much more cut out than others. Yeah, I do that every time I yawn. Or maybe not exactly that, but, you know, some kind of burst of insanity. It's my thing, y'all. Yeah, so we, yeah, we, I keep saying we as if it wasn't me doing the vast majority of this on my own. As it was. And that's how I like it, to be honest. Anyway, the conduit is very securely attached to the insulation. Duct tape, foil tape, spray foam. Very, very... Very set, very happy. These are jolly little bits of conduit. Very happy conduit. Ooh, la, la, la. I also foil taped over the the plywood beams that I added because restoration couple Tim, as I like to refer to him as, uh, says that this will help prevent condensation happening just on the screw heads, which might rust the screw heads. I figure, you know, for the sake of six quid and a bit of time, it was worth doing that. Even if I'm not really trying to go for a vape barrier elsewhere, I kind of have one on the ceiling. And, you know, that can't be a, a particularly bad thing. I still think the whole concept of a vape barrier is just weird, though, because there's no way that you're actually going to seal off everything. I just feel like it's a concept that doesn't actually make sense in the real world. But so many people do it. I don't know. I can't help feeling that either I'm missing something or... I've cracked the code and everyone else in the world is an idiot. Um, which, let's face it, is pretty unlikely at this point. <laughs> it's more likely that I'm missing something. Option A. Anywho, enough of that nonsense. You don't want to listen to me about that sort of thing. I am but a mere cretin. A mere cretin on the internet. Oh yeah, this, this then happened the next day before I started boarding on the ceiling. But I drilled holes 
for my battery to battery cable in the bulkhead. I ended up doing that right in the middle of the bulkhead approximately because to drill right next to the driver's side, the driver's seat, like I would have intended to, that that's where the handbrake is on the Ducato. So I couldn't have gotten it as low. It would have been, I don't know, 30, 40 centimeters up the wall, which I just felt was a bit weird. I'd rather keep the cable low. I think it will use, it'll waste less cable in terms of length, basically. So I did it in, in the middle. I used these, these rubber grommets, which obviously generated a lot of enjoyable, terrible Wallace impressions. Where are your pesky grommets? And kind of went okay. They don't really want to bend to, they, they, they're kind of at max bend. The way, the way I've put them, but I should be covering that with the bottom of the wall that sits in front of the bulkhead. So that should be fine. It also made me realize that I need more cable for that. So I've ordered another one meter. Keep punching the mic, it's not good. It's gonna sound terrible. <laughs> um, I've ordered an extra one meter of, of both of those, which is 16 millimeter squared. Hopefully one meter extra is enough. I did feel like I was pretty close to having enough, but just not quite, which is annoying. Uh, just to kind of handle the extra twists and turns it's got to do at each end. Like the negative is fine at the starter battery end, but it's probably going to need to go a little bit further because it's the, the, the negative of all the batteries is going to be at the rear end of the van and the positive is going to be at the front. So the negative needs to be a bit longer at that end, but the positive has to kind of like snake around the battery and then into a fuse and then to the positive of the star battery. So it needs a little bit more. I think I think one meter is gonna be enough. I've also had to I order more of my big, big fat cable, my 35 millimeter squared, that's gonna be like into battery and then to the to the or to the, all the sources of power um, at the beginning before they split off into smaller circuits. That that stuff's like 10 pounds a meter. That's that's quite it's quite expensive. I fear that I'm actually going to need even more than another meter, but I don't really want to buy 10 pounds a meter cable and then be wrong that I didn't need it. So I'm, I'm holding off on that. We'll, we'll see lads. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to go. It could, could be a flipping disaster, Mike. Yeah. Don't even try and pinpoint my accents, voices to like a place. They're always a total mess. I do like an Aussie, but I mean, it doesn't mean it's good, does it? Yeah, that's that's basically this stage done. Insulating uh, the ceiling and kind of getting the conduit in place and the wiring. I did a bit of extra stuff that isn't strictly necessary, but I was gonna have to do pretty soon anyway. It was a bit fiddly and frustrating at first. It felt like I wasn't going to be able to get through the conduit the, the first time I was trying. Much like drilling into the ceiling with the self-tapping screws, it felt impossible for the first one. And then once I got it, it was all right. The knack was basically, you got to bundle the whole thing up together and push it through as one. And ideally, pull it through as well as push it through. Or pull it through, or push it through, but just don't attach the conduit yet. That way you can kind of like shake it about and you know, you can you can kind of like wobble and push at the same time. Give it the old wobbly push, which I don't know what this is and it looks weird, but you know, you can do that and that does definitely help. Although if you had a really long conduit, I think, I think you need to pull at the same time. You'd have no choice. In a van, you might get away with it. Yeah, it, it was kind of, I kind of enjoyed the cutting and pulling cable by the end. I just, brought my laptop and I was listening to an audiobook and I was just doing it in the evening and it, it was pretty chill. I quite liked it. I am generally enjoying the electrics quite a lot. I mean it's been a it's been a huge pain in terms of the amount of information that I've had to take in and the amount of planning I've had to do. But it's cool and I kinda I kinda get it. I kinda I kinda dig it. I think I have a, a much greater aptitude for it than I do with the woodworking because of doing physics at A-level and doing like music production and computers, you know, you kind of understand the whole like input and output dynamic. And I have a little bit of a grounding in, you know, how electric, electric circuits work, all of the equations. 
I can't really remember them until I'm reminded of them, but then I'm kind of like, oh yes, I did a lot of that. And I've forgotten all of it. School. It's almost useless 10 years later. God, it's more than 10 years later. It's nearly 12 years later. <laughs> but yeah, that that's that's about it. Um, I would I would be made into a very happy little bouncy bunny if you were to like and subscribe. Or, you know, just send, send me some hate comments because I've I've heard that once you start getting haters, that's that's when that's when stuff's actually getting getting good. So um if you want to kick that off with, with some hate, I, I would I would enjoy that tremendously. Or maybe I wouldn't, maybe it would crush me inside. Anyway, um I'll I'll see you guys see you later, Taters. I don't get why all YouTubers end in the same way. And they usually start in the same way as well. Like, where did that trope come from? Is that really a thing that you should do in order to be good at YouTube? Because it seems like everyone does it. But it just doesn't make any sense to me. I can't imagine just being that robotic. I feel like if I'm going to do anything like that, I need to subvert it in some way. It's got to be... I've, I've got to take that concept and then flip it. A bit like um, Philip Solo, where... You know, he he starts with here's the scoop, but every time he does it in some weird zany way, like it never sounds the same. Like he sort of technically says the same thing, but it, it will be like totally crazy and ridiculous. I quite like that, but I feel like I can't just directly pill for that idea. Or maybe I can. I mean, I can't say here's the scoop because I, I mean, he's Canadian. It just sounds right coming out of his mouth, but. You know, maybe there's maybe there's something that I can say that would suit my my British charms. Ah, I don't know how I survived Australia without getting punched a few times due to just accidentally busting out dodgy Australian accents in front of Australian people. It, it seemed to be fine. I seemed to get away with it, and no one even called me out on it at any point. And it definitely happened because I just do it accidentally. I do it without even thinking about it. Anyway.